No one does good, not even one. Created to live in loving relationship with the Lord our God, we've turned our backs to Him for the fleeting pleasures of the world. We forget the God who sustains us. We pour out our worship to creation rather than the Creator. But there is one who is worthy of our praise, who has poured out his righteousness onto us. Lord, let our hearts behold you and be wholly satisfied. Let us run this race knowing that the finish line is an eternity with our Father. He is our stronghold and our salvation. He is our hope. Teach our hearts to delight in your law. Let us rejoice and be glad for the God of our salvation is near to us. Lord, redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Let us sing your praises that your glory would shine throughout the earth. Good morning. Our text for today is going to be out of Psalm chapter 14, if you would like to turn. Um, If you don't have a Bible, there is a Bible in the seat back in front of you, if you would like to grab one. Once again, that is Psalm chapter 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for the Lord, for the God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge." Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you uh, for that reading. Uh, For those of you who don't know me, my name is Darren Smith. I'm a non-staff elder, a member of the preaching and teaching team. We're so glad um, that you're here today. You've obviously caught us in the middle of a sermon series on the book of Psalms, um, Poems of Praise. And Um, We're looking forward to that study today. Before we jump into that, we just have um, an exciting thing we want to celebrate. Um, Many of you saw it in the newsletter a couple of weeks ago, but on June 16th, we opened uh, the new Argyle building. Um, And if you didn't see it, we've got some photos up here. You know that um, our heart and our vision as a church is to be uh, a church that multiplies and plants new churches. And um, we weren't looking for a new building. Uh, God brought us uh, this opportunity earlier this year, and uh, we were able to get into the space, and um, it is a, a beautiful building, uh, but it's just that. It's just a building, the church of the folks that are there, and we're so excited about the work that the Lord is going to do in that community. That, that building is located across the street from the Argyle Middle School, so it's very visible, and I think it's going to bring a lot of people um, through the doors there. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your, your generosity. You hear us talk about uh, being one heart and one soul, and that, that means that we give of ourselves uh, for each other. And this is made possible uh, because of the work of the Holy Spirit, but also uh, because of you and your generosity and working uh, through you. And so thank you. Um, we know that that's not an easy thing to do, uh, but we believe that that fulfills Christ's great commission Uh, where he says, go into all the world. And our hope is that Argyle has to do that exact same thing within a couple of years and and fill all that as well. So uh, we just wanted to celebrate that with you and say say thank you as we jump into the sermon today. So with that said, obviously we're uh, we're in the book of of Psalms and today we come uh, to the great Psalm, the 14th Psalm. Now, when you think about Psalms, Um, I would say that it is probably uh, one of the most accessible parts of the Bible. So um, people who are new to faith or or those who are searching or seeking, uh, they'll often uh, go to to Psalms. And I think that's because it's so accessible uh, to people. And that's because it's really a collection of poems, 
of songs and of praise, and they express this wide range of emotions. And so as you came into uh, this gathering today, um, you are going uh, through your own things, right? And so there are people in here who are mourning uh, and, and you're in deep sorrow. There are people who are um, fearful and anxious. Uh, there are people that have um, identity issues. They have things that they're trying to, to solve themselves. And so as you come in here today, um, there's something in the, book, in, the, in the books of Psalms for you. There's always something there, whether it's love, adoration, sorrow, dependence, desperation, thankfulness, and even uh, devotion. And they're all there. And these, these serve sort of a reflection of, of our souls, but more than that, they're, they're a pattern to shape our emotions and to shape um, our actions. Now, the one thing I do want to point out, although they are accessible, they are deep, deep theologically. So I think sometimes we read over them and we think that um, they soothe us and they comfort us, but they are tied to theology. And one of the things to think about is, indeed, as our Savior uh, was uh, came to earth and, and grew up, he would have read these psalms. They would have been prayed over him. He would have sang them. They um, were things that he committed to memory, and they were things that he quoted throughout his ministry. And then you see it throughout the rest of the Bible and the epistles. Now, when we get to Psalms 14, Psalm 14 is what they call a, a lament. Uh, it's, it's a sorrowful song. It's a lamenting song. Uh, the author is David. And when we get to this psalm, <clears throat> we're going to see that in this world, there are basically two types of people. There are, there are people who reject uh, God, and they are people that either uh, explicitly reject God or they reject God by their lives, right? So there's those people. And then there's these um, people that God calls the generation of the righteous. And what happens is that because people reject God, they begin to persecute the generation of the righteous. So there's this tension in this psalm. When I think of this psalm, I think of a story that happened uh, to me, actually because of me. Uh, <clears throat> when I moved to Dallas, I worked at a public relations firm, and that's a professional service firm. And if you know anything about professional service firms, uh, you have to fill out timesheets, right? This is what you have to do. You fill out timesheets, and then that's sent to some scary people in finance and accounting, uh, and they put together bills, and then the bills go to the clients, and, and then the money comes in. And if the money doesn't come in, that's where things get scary, right? And so if you don't do your timesheets, you're not accounted for and you're not billed for and therefore you're useless and you can kind of see how the, all that goes. Well, back in the olden days, uh, the early 2000s, uh, when we still had phones at our desks, we actually still had to go into the office. That's another story, right? But uh, we had to be there. We had phones at our desks and um, the CEO of this global agency who worked, uh, he lived in New York and Chicago, he still looked at timesheets um, because it was about the money, right? And so um, one day I hadn't filled mine out. And so the admin came in and said, hey, Darren, you better fill out your timesheet or you're gonna get a call from the CEO. And I was um, <clears throat> full of hubris and I said, yeah, sure. You just have him call me. You just put it through to my line and I'll pick it up, right? So I imagined, I was a nobody, right? And so I imagined this cloak of invisibility because he was far away. He was distant. He was really a myth. I'd never met him, never really seen him, but he was this name, right? He was, he was this myth far away. And so then I was just going to go do whatever I wanted to do by myself. It wasn't but a couple of days later, same admin called me and said, hey, Darren, the CEO is on the phone for you. And I said, Right. And he said, no, no, he's, he's, he's on the phone for you. And I said, right. And then all of a sudden, my stomach starts to drop. He says, no, he's on. And I'm like, well, his name's on the building. Go ahead and put him through, right? And so if you could have heard my side of the story, I answered the phone and I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And I hung up, right? Now, the, the, the cool part of that story is he was calling me about another topic altogether. Wasn't even calling me about timesheets, but I promise you, 
from that moment on, I realized that he was a real person. He was living and active, and he had the ability to see me, and he had the ability to reach down into my world and to direct me. And the reason I'm telling you that story today is because I think so many times people, the world, humans, we treat God in that exact way. We either, number one, don't believe that he exists, or number two, we treat him as if he is so far away that he would never even see us, and we cloak it in humility, but it's not humility, it's pride. And I think that's what Psalm 14 is going to address today, this human condition. And it's also going to address this fact because when you have this human condition, when you don't think God is living and active, then what happens is people start to mistreat other people, especially those who do believe in God and to acknowledge him. And so this Psalm mourns that that way that we treat each other. But the key verse is gonna be found in, in verse five, where it says, God is with the generation of the righteous. And that's our title today, that despite all of this lament, God is with the generation of the righteous. So there's just three things I wanna break this into today. Three uh, movements. Number one, I wanna look at this idea of the fool. So we'll see uh, the fool and the foolishness, uh, the condition of humanity. Number two, the righteous, the generation of the righteous. What exactly does that mean? And then number three, there is a great restoration that happens in this psalm. So there's this community lament, but God is faithful and he restores his people. So let's jump in to that first idea of the foolish. The fool says in his heart, so verse one, fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is no, none, no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. You know, this is a, this is a, um, a psalm that you hear a lot, and you'll hear um, people talking about the foolish in the world. The fool says in their heart, there is no God. But it's important, I think, for us to understand the words that are actually being used here and the connotation and the context, okay? So the first thing is this idea of a fool. What is a fool? So we have to um, sort of step out of our modern world. If we were to call somebody a fool, uh, we might also say, you know, not a kind word, but we might call somebody an idiot or they're not smart. They lack intelligence. They're foolish. That's kind of how I look at it. And, and, and everyone has their own connotation of that. But when we talk about a fool in this context, it is not lack of intelligence. It is um, more of someone who has uh, moral foolishness, who acts uh, morally incor- corrupt, it's a scoundrel. It's a rogue. Um, I saw one commentator say that it was like their wisdom and godliness had dried up out of them. So this is not um, somebody who lacks knowledge. Um, it's someone who lacks wisdom. Now, the really cool part about this is that the, the word used here for the word fool is the word nabal, okay? Okay. Now, those of you who know the story of David, the author of this, you'll know the story of Nabal. And it's important that we understand this. And it's really cool, uh, the word that he chose to use here. So um, you recall the story of the first king. Uh, Israel wanted a king. God said no. They persisted. He gave them Saul. Saul was uh, deemed uh, corrupt. And so the, the kingdom was ripped away. And David was appointed as the next king. But Because of that, Saul continued uh, to pursue David, uh, and he was looking to find him and to kill him. And then in 1 Samuel 25, as that's happening, David is fleeing, and he bumps into this man named Nabal, okay? Same word for fool. He bumps into Nabal, who is intelligent, successful, and, and very, very wealthy, And so then uh, David comes to him and requests help. 
He requests provisions, uh, which in that culture um, was something that you could do. You could request that. And so they came and they did it. And Nabal says, who is David, right? Who is this guy? Who do you think you are, right? Um, you're not the king. Get out of here. I don't have to help you. And so uh, David tells his guys, um, get your swords, right? This is a, it's about to go down. But in the middle of all of this, Nabal's wife, um, a woman named Abigail, she hears about it and she intercedes. And so she comes to David humbly and she gives him all of the provisions uh, that he requested. See, she recognized who he was. She recognized that he was the, the king, the chosen one. And so as that story goes on, a few weeks later, Nabal dies and David marries Abigail. And that's the closing of that story. And so when David calls somebody Nabal, he's telling us they're arrogant. They don't recognize the presence of the rightful and the future king, right? And so when the fool in his heart says there is no God, it's someone who doesn't recognize the presence of our Lord. This fool secondarily says, there is no God. They say there is no God. Now, <clears throat> if you're like me, as you grew up and you read this, you, you probably thought of modern day atheists, right? We always go to Richard Hawkins. Let's, let's pick on him. Let's go to him, right? Now, the interesting thing is I do believe that this passage would include that, but that's not the intent of the passage. Modern day atheism wasn't even invented, I think, until like the 1600s, 1700s with the Enlightenment, right? But up until this time, everyone believed in God or a God. There were no atheists as we see them today. Rather, I believe what David is telling us is what we could call a practical atheism. And, and hear me say this, I think, I think modern atheism is, is sinister and we need to attack it. But I think for us, this idea of practical atheism is, is much more sinister. And what that basically means is we pay lip service that there is a God. And then just like me at my PR firm, I just go and do whatever I want to do. And so we act as if God isn't around or he isn't involved. Now, this is um, part of the original lie. This goes all the way back to Genesis, the third chapter. If you think about Genesis, the third chapter, um, Adam and Eve are walking with the Lord. And some point, Satan is able to kind of have a side conversation with them. And they're over there bargaining with Satan. And it's like they have forgotten the maker of the universe, <laughs> right? They were just walking with him. They were just conversing with him. And it's like they think that he can't overhear or can't see he's far away. And so men begin to worship themselves, and that's where we go, right? And so they say in their heart, they say it in their heart, there is no God. This foolish person says there's no God. I'm going to separate myself from God. And so the point is this, what you say to your heart is where your morality goes. What you believe in your heart, what you say to yourself, it informs your actions. And so um, what this is, is the decay and the sinfulness of mankind. If God isn't around, then we should just do what we want to do. If he doesn't exist, or if he's not watching, if he's not a part of our life, if he isn't active, he doesn't care, then you should just do what you want to do, right? And that's where this morality goes. When the fool says in his heart, there is no God, um, it changes the course of his life. The Bible says that the Lord gazes intently on the children of men. And so God is looking down on us. Now, most of the Psalms are going to be about us looking up to God. In this one, we get this, this record of God looking down on us. And he's, he's looking around and he's, he's asking if any understand or who seek God. Now, be clear here, God doesn't literally need to know if there's anyone who's doing good. He knows it, but he's looking down. And what that basically means is he is active. He sees and he knows and he's involved. And so with this wisdom and divine justice, he sees us. 
Again, back to my little example of me thinking I had a cloak of invisibility that I could do what I wanted to do, that I was impervious, that they wouldn't condescend to talk to me. And here's the point in all of that. When he looks down upon us, when he looks down upon this generation of people, we can't possibly meet the demands of that maker. He seeks those who understand him. So this is going to be offensive to the world in general. One of the most offensive things that you can say to people today um, is that you're sinful, right? The way that you think and you express yourself and who you are and what you wanna be and all those things that we celebrate, right? Um, This is offensive when we stop and we tell people, you're not all that. In fact, you're less than that. You're completely corrupt and sinful, right? That is the teaching of the gospel. And the world will tell you that you're basically good, that you're basically okay. And so there's this humanistic uh, value that we assign to each other. Indeed, um, a few weeks ago, uh, the, the head of the Catholic Church was interviewed and he, uh, he sat there and they, they asked, what, what have you learned? And he said, I have learned that people are basically good. Now, I wanna give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe that was edited. Maybe there was more to that question and maybe more to his answer. But that simple statement is false. You are not basically good. People are not basically good. They're not seeking to basically do good. We have no ability to please God. And that's my point for us this morning is that you and I are foolish. We are all foolish. I think when traditionally we read this passage as as those who've put our faith and trust in Christ, we we point it outward. And, And certainly for those who've not accepted Jesus, they are foolish. But I wanna challenge us today to see the foolishness in our own hearts. You see, um, I'll speak for myself. Uh, I pay this intellectual assent to, to, to God, right? Now, I, I, will, I will say with my lips that God exists, and then I'll turn around and live as if God doesn't exist. And that is the foolishness that we're talking about. Um, the Apostle Paul addresses this, and um, Psalm 14 is quoted in the great epistle to the book of uh, to Rome, uh, to the to the church at Rome. And so, if you remember from our study in Romans, um, Romans starts off with really bad news, and that is everyone is corrupt and everyone's sinful. And um, there's these two groups of people. There's these Gentiles who are basically heathens, and there's these Jewish people who know God. They don't know Christ yet, but they think that because, well, I guess they do know Christ at that point, but they think because of their Jewish heritage, they're better, right? And so Paul is talking, and he's going at him, and he's going at him, and then he gets to, to Romans 2, and he says, you You who would condemn other people, you do the same thing. And then in Romans 3, he actually quotes uh, Psalm 14. He reads it. And and then at the end of it, he says this in verse uh, 19. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And so what he's saying here, he stops it and he goes, all of those of you who think that your your religious background, your heritage is making you better than all the other people that I've been talking about, you need to stop. You need to shut your mouth is what he says because you too are that person and you are foolish. And here's what I have for us today is um, how do you and I, those um, who profess Christianity, those who, who say we're close to the Lord, that there is a God, how dare people are atheists, right? We say all those things, but then we ignore the Holy Spirit in our lives. We live without prayer. Um, we, we try to bootstrap things ourselves. We find our value in, in our money and in our homes and our jobs and our families and all these things that we do, we're being foolish. 
We're being foolish because you're trusting your own strength and you don't see God actively involved in it. You know, um, it's so funny. Sometimes I catch myself praying and I'll say, Lord, be with me. <clears throat> and, and, then, and I've been convicted of that. I'm like, no, Lord, I don't need you to be with me. I need you to change my heart and make me want to be with you. Like, I don't need your help. I need your direct intervention. I need to be changed, right? Little things like that is how we push God away and we think that we've got it. Jesus, take the will. No, you shouldn't have the will. What are you doing? Get in the back seat. Like, what are you thinking? The Lord is calling me and you to repent today. Acknowledge him and acknowledge his active presence in our lives. Number two, there's these righteous people. Verse four through six, have they no knowledge all the evildoers eat up my people as they eat up bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror for God is with the generation of the righteous. You who would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. And so we have this flip in the narrative, right? And so this is this, there's this, it goes kind of into the voice of God. What is what is God saying? A fool, a fool will harm God's people. Continuing that thought of all these foolish people, they are going to persecute the people. But the righteous, there's a generation of righteous people, and they're not the people who do all the right things. They are the people that put their faith and their hope in God and in Jesus Christ. And so he goes into this and he says, the fool will eat up my people and they'll do it like cannibals. Um, they'll do it just as naturally as sitting down to dinner because there's nothing worse at a party than someone who reigns on your parade, right? So if you're trying to live as a fool in wickedness and you're around those people who acknowledge God, there's nothing worse than that to them. And so they will then cannibalize each other and others. But the Bible, the, the Psalm says their dread is certain. You know, the funny thing about sin and living far away from God is that it is uh, enjoyable for a short period of time. There's something about it, right? There's, there, otherwise, you wouldn't do it. There's a rush. Uh, there's, there's something about it that you think that that's what you want and what you what you learn with sin is you think you can control it and it quickly controls you and then you become a slave to it. And this passage is telling us that their dread is certain because slavery to sin is hard. And because of that, they will hate the freeborn children of God and they will mock them and they will per persecute them. And they have this great fear and this great panic and terror because all cruel people are cowards at heart but a day is coming. A day is coming where they will wake up and see that the Lord is with those who seek him. And surely you can feel that in David, right? A lot of David's life was about a day is coming when people will, will see and I will be vindicated. God is with the generation and he provides a refuge. The, the wicked will mock. <clears throat> Here's the thing. The wicked don't understand the gospel. They, they think that we control God, and so when we do good things, God will bless us, but that's not the gospel, is it, right? That's not the blessings that were promised. And so when, when a Christian, when those who put their faith and trust in Christ, those who profess him are going along and good things don't happen, the wicked will mock that because they don't understand that our redemption is eternal. It's not necessarily out of that circumstance and they don't get all of that, but they will mock you. And so they see this equation that if you're not having success in your life, then surely God is punishing you. But that's not what the Bible says and that's not what the gospel says. God is with the generation of the righteous. So they don't understand it, but they feel the influence of that power. And indeed, um, there, there's no greater uh, power uh, than the person who's being persecuted or the person who is going through in, intense struggles in life who glorify God. It's the story of the book of Job. And so the generation of the righteous we are not meant to live in this place. We've talked about this before. This is, this is not our home. You see, 
They think that it's their home. Those who uh, try to eat up the righteous, that this is, this is their home. And so they think if, if they can mock this place, then they've got us. But you see, we live in a broken world and we know that and we accept that. Nothing is, is working as it's supposed to. This is not the way it's supposed to be. People around us are dying. People around us are sick. We get old, um, things hurt. We live in this broken world and we suffer under the weight of the fall. And what this passage is telling us is that's made worse because we're held under by the foolishness of people. And so here's my question for us today. When things don't turn out the way that you expect, when, you, when things don't turn out um, the way that they should be, where do you turn? Where do you run? You'll run to seek refuge. And so these foolish people will go try to, to, to make their own uh, uh, bits and pieces of refuge, whatever that is, whatever it is, whatever we build up, but it's decaying and it's breaking away. And there's only one place where we can run for refuge. I love this passage in John the sixth chapter <clears throat> gives a glimpse of the ministry of Jesus. And so, you know, when people first started following Jesus, uh, everything was fun, right? Uh, it was cool, right? Here's a teacher. He's different. He's hip, right? And so they're following him and the way was relatively easy. And he's, he's giving great lessons and teachings, but there comes a point in his ministry where he, it, it turns and people begin to understand the weight of who Jesus is, and, and that's off-putting to people. And so in John chapter 6, people start to turn away. Verse 66 says, After this, many of disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, God gives us refuge in one place, in one place alone. And that is in the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus has the words of eternal life. It's the only place to seek refuge. And so this foolish person will try to tear that person down. And yet the Lord will give refuge to those who seek him. And then that brings us to the third point, this idea of restoration. And this is just one verse in Psalm 14. Psalm 14, 7, it says, Oh, the salvation for Israel will come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. So salvation will come out of Zion. No matter the calamity that uh, God will give his people a hope for a better day. Again, he doesn't take us out of the situations of this life. That's not the hope. The hope is not uh, necessarily the cure. It's not the answer. The hope is that we will be with God forever and that salvation will come out of Zion. And our, our people, God's people will survive because the Lord is with them. Here's what's beautiful about this passage. Um, David wrote, oh, that salvation... That word salvation, the, the Hebrew word that he uses is the word Yeshua. Yeshua will become the word Jesus in the Greek. And so generations, generations before Jesus is born, uh, David, the king, sits on the throne and he writes about um, his descendant, and he writes that he will come out of Zion, Zion, the city that David will establish, Jerusalem, and it will come from that where the Lord lives. Jesus will come. And I, 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 like I just want to set in a minute, I just want to set for a minute and just, would you marvel how beautiful that is? Would you marvel how beautiful it is that David wrote that about someone that would come from his lineage? from the promise that God created, from the city in which David would establish forever. You see, when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, <clears throat> it's fulfilling this promise. And prior to Jesus, they looked for this salvation. They looked for the Messiah. And the first advent came 
but it came in God's timing. It came when God was ready for it at the perfect time. And it was meant for all of God's people forever. And so then the psalmist David writes, let everyone celebrate and everyone be glad. And this is a natural closing uh, to this psalm at the appearance of the Messiah. And so Jesus knew that sin abounded, but his glorious advent came to bring us refuge and restoration. And blessed are those who wait for him. And so this is the point. You and I are not, not, not meant for this place. We are headed for a home for a world with no more trouble, a world of complete 100% refuge. You know, really, I, I, I read this and I thought this was, was pretty wise. Someone said the, the Bible is really just about three locations, right? There's the garden and the fall and the world that happens because of that. Then there's the hill of Calvary where Christ uh, redeemed us and gave us a new heart. And then there's this new Jerusalem, this, this home to which we're headed. And it's lit by the brightness of the sun and it is our final restoration. Your final home will be utterly unlike anything you've ever experienced. Prophet Jeremiah gives us hope in Jeremiah 32, verse 38. Talking for God, he says, and they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me into their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and with all my soul. And so praise God that the Lord will restore our lives through Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, I think back to my foolishness as a young man, and my time at work and you know, as I just, I thought that I was invisible and then therefore could do whatever I wanted. And I think about myself and, and I apply Psalm 14 to me and I'm convicted. And I know there's areas in my life that I must repent and I must practice that daily presence of God and understand that, that he is alive and active and he sees the foolish, but he knows the righteous. He knows us. And God is with our generation. He's calling us to repent and to acknowledge him. He's seeking to give refuge to those who seek him. And he will restore our lives through Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, we come to you this morning and we, um, we just stop. And we just uh, sit in your presence and as we said earlier, we don't pray, Lord, that you would be with us. Uh, we pray that you would give us a new heart and the desire to be with you, that we would be in your presence and that we would know you fully. Lord, we are so foolish. We are so foolish. We, we, we remove you from our lives and from our hearts. And we live our lives in our own way in so many ways. And Lord, would you be merciful to us and forgive us and convict us of that. Help us to see the things in our, in our lives where we've done that. And Lord, we pray for a, an intervention from the Spirit. that You would convict us and change us. Lord, we are, um, we are so taken aback that you would bring salvation to us that you promised it and you delivered it. And we pray that we would just set in the reality of Jesus. Thank you for him. Thank you for what he is and does for us. And we pray that you would change us into his likeness. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In his beautiful name, we say amen.